are the top stories in what we have for you. Parliament has approved the report of a report of the Committee on National Economy to guarantee it's our issue. We apologize for that. Parliament has approved the report of the national the Committee on National Economy to guarantee Uganda Development Bank to borrow 15 million euros from the European Investment Bank. It also approved borrowing 10 million US dollars from the International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation. 20 million US dollars from OPIC fund for international development and another 20 million US dollars from the Arab Bank for the economic development in Africa. The borrowing is aimed at recapitalizing Uganda Development Bank to enable it finance both small scale businesses and large scale investments despite the 450 billion shillings that government invested in the UDB at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have details to this from Parliament. Our issue was in relation to the complaints which came recently uh, that uh, people are receiving lesser units than what they paid for. And Umeme in the explanation uh, put in very many issues, including service fee. And we are saying service fee has to stop. We can't go back to the analog era. You know, service fee over what? Which service are you giving me when I'm not using your power? I buy my units digitally. You can't tell me you're sending people to my area to deliver, to, 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 to deliver receipts, to deliver what, no. Everything, I'm doing it by phone. I'm doing it in a modern way. So why are you serving or charging me service fee? For what? Number one, we are saying the cost of electricity in the country is very high. When you break down the tariff, there are very many components within the tariff. And then you are allowing also service fee. So we are saying service fee has to stop, and the minister has promised that she's going to come on the floor and give more details on that. But I think we shall pass a resolution as parliament that service fee for electricity should stop. It stopped for telecoms. I don't see why we have it for electricity. How fast would you want this resolution passed? No, as soon as yesterday. It should be resolved as soon as yesterday. Because you see, if I'm sick, I've been in a hospital for eight months. I go back home. I buy units for 10K, okay? And, 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 and then <laughs> all of a sudden you give me zero units because I paid for service fee. And you claim you gave me a debt. Who told you to give me that debt? Did I ask for it? So we have to be very, very straightforward. And, and these are issues of confidence. If people lose confidence in such a system, then we shall be getting a problem as a country. Now in the tariff, the tariff is determined by the regulator. And I'd actually requested her that she needs to go and give an official, an official, I think on the, on the media center. So it is not Umeme who determines the tariff. The regulator determines the tariff, which is cuts across whether it's Umeme, whether it is UEDCL, whether it is Wundibujo, Sako, okay, we have dissolved them. They all have the same tariff from the regulator. That's the, the correction that I wanted to make. But we shall be able to get the information and pass it on but to us. Honorable Chair, we, we have that report. Energy and Mineral Development Minister Mary Goret Kitutu has assured the country that her ministry is working with the Electricity Regulatory Authority to resolve the issue of fluctuated tariffs for electricity consumers. 
The minister told the members of parliament on the Committee of Natural Resources today that she has already tasked the Electricity Regulatory Authority to provide an explanation after her ministry received complaints from different parts of the country. The Ministry of Energy officials were appearing before the Committee on Natural Resources to defend the 1.57 trillion shillings budget for the financial year 2021-22. We'll have that story about the Electricity Regulatory Authority later on. Moving on, the National Executive Director, Nira Brigadier Stephen Quiringira, has hailed the Minister for Information and National Guidance, Judith Nabakova, for the extension of IT services to their regional offices. He says this has eased the process of capturing and issuance of national identity cards and other related documents to Ugandans. The Minister for ICT, Judith Navakova, in company of UBC's Deputy Managing Director, Morris Mujisha, was on a working tour of the Eastern Uganda, where she visited some UBC installations, met media groups in Tororo and Bali, plus the Busia border post. The Minister for Information and National Guidance, Judith Navakova's four-day working tour in the eastern region has ended with interaction with officials from National Identification and Registration Authority, NIRA. Honorable Minister, at an opportune time this afternoon, my uh, technical team here will be able to demonstrate to you how our operations have been improved by the connectivity. The Executive Director, NIRA. Brigadier General Stephen Quiringira commended the ICT Ministry for the Information Technology Services, which has eased their operations. Real-time transmission of data from the registration centers to headquarters. Real-time receiving of issuance data from headquarters to service centers. The above improvements, Honorable Minister, imply that the many clients who had to travel to the NIRA Corolla headquarters no longer need to do so. And this has tremendously reduced the numbers of people that used to flock to Corolla. The minister was in the company of Nita Yu, executive director, Dr. Mogashia Hatrib. We have connected sites, uh, 300 sites of NIRA, but we intend to connect all sites or all regional centers of NIRA. That way, it will be much faster to get an ID. Nabakova noted that Ugandans are in need of such documents, and therefore, timely processing is key. And remember, when we talk about an ID, it's an identification card. That is the way a person can identify themselves, that they are Ugandans, they are from Mbale, from a certain village, you know? That information is very critical, and now, even coming to access of some government services, you, you may realize that ID will be very crucial for somebody to access probably treatment, for somebody to access vaccination. Right now, there is flexibility, but going forward, everybody must have a national ID. Navakova also inspected Tororo. Busha and Mbali Posta Uganda facilities, which are currently transiting from manual to digital transactions. They are available on any mobile platform, such as a smartphone or a computer. And one of the products we've digitized right away is addressing. Ugandans are able to apply for addresses, pay for them, and even edit them online. So it's no longer necessary now to drive the post office to trade with the post office. You do it on your phone. The minister's countryside working tour now turns to Renzot sub-region this Thursday, 22nd April 2021. Robert Nyango, 
UBC News, Eastern Uganda. The Departed Asian Properties Custodian Board has released a list of Asian properties that have been illegally acquired by individuals across the country. The Secretary to the Board, Judge William Bizibu, says that the full list has been availed to the Parliamentary Select Committee of Commissions, statutory authorities and state enterprises for investigations. The Secretary to the Departed Asians Properties Custodian Board, George William Bizibu, says government is losing trillions of shillings in a major scam where close to 10,000 properties under the Departed Asians Properties have been fraudulently acquired by top business personalities and leaders in government. He disclosed that most of those involved in the illegal deals claim to have powers of attorney by the original proprietors of the properties in question, but the board's visit to London and Canada to establish the source of attorney disclosed that all the powers of attorney were a hoax. Some of the, pro the former owners died something back. They don't have letters of probate. They don't have letters of, uh, letters of administration. They have nothing to show to these authorities so that they can transfer title. So what these people have decided, they have decided just to uh, just to uh, to mint money out of these properties. They are dilapidated. That is the question people would be answering. I mean, asking, how come that somebody repossessed the property in 1992, but today somebody has not added in the first lift, not even a pen. Not even replacing a door, not even replacing... Bizibu said that to make matters worse, those claiming to have powers of attorney have no management contracts and evidence of remittance of rent to the owners and no tax clearance certificate. Many people don't have Lexus to these properties, so they cannot transfer. And they don't have any uh, authority attaching them to the properties. In terms of ownership. In terms of ownership. Most of the shabby properties, the shabby buildings, are those ones. Come to Kampala, they are those ones. Go to Kabul, they are those ones. Go to Iganga, they are those ones. Masaka, they are those ones. Kamuli, they are those ones. Because people are not sure of what they are investing in. He further disclosed that government spends over two million US dollars as compensation to some of the proprietors of some of the disputed properties. The board has refuted media reports that they are illegally concealing repossession certificates in order to resell the properties. The board chairperson, Abdallah Biakatonda, said that the propaganda by the mafias is aimed at tarnishing the image of the board and trying to find avenues to force the board wind up its work prematurely so that they can still possess the properties. They are selling. They are the landlords without any kind of authority. So what is important is now for those who have all the records clear, we need support from the government, political will. Because the issue is that, uh, one, they have been trying to defame. So that I think even the public or our organs of government think a certain body is an which is not worth it dealing with. The Katikiro of Buganda Kingdom, Charles Peter Maiga, has positioned Buganda Kingdom as a brand that investors in different sectors of the economy can leverage on for sustainable growth and development. He, however, cautions investors who go against Buganda land board rules and guidelines of getting land titles. Kampala is the commercial capital of Uganda. Over the years, the city has attracted massive investments from local and foreign investors. As we all know, investments come with direct financial injections. Which those near those areas of investments benefit from. These developments have not only spurred social and economic growth of the central region, but also contributed immensely on Uganda's economic growth. The Buganda Premier, who was gracing over the launch of the Starbex International Star Cave at Lubiri Mengo, persuaded investors to work with Buganda Kingdom in order to gain more leverage. We have breached the market, my friends. <laughs> so I invite you to work with us with a view to introducing you to the market. 
There is no bigger brand in this country than the Kingdom of Uganda. Probably it's the biggest brand even in South Africa. So, why do you sweat a lot? Don't make these small sweat breaks. Sweat big with a big brand. <laughs> His sentiments were re-echoed by Haji Hamis Kakomo, the Buganda Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Industry. We want to thank you very much for being good tenants and always meeting your obligations on time. STARCF is a new development by Starbucks International, whose main objective is to provide a one-stop center for its customers. In the recent years, fuel stations have diversified their businesses to suit the needs of the ever-changing trends of the customers. Saddam Mubali and Dennis Igoa, UBC News. State Minister for Primary Health Care, Dr. Joyce Moriko Kaduchu, has warned the public about the negative effects of the ongoing heavy rains. Kaduchu wants Ugandans to ensure good sanitation and hygiene, among other measures. The ongoing rains are good for farmers, but without observing hygiene and sanitation guidelines, waterborne diseases might emerge. The Minister of State for Health, Dr. Joyce Moriku, says floods can be habitats of germs that cause cholera, berhazias, and typhoid. State Minister for Primary Health Care, Dr. Joyce Moriku Kaduchu, says government has played its role in eradicating malaria. We encourage the communities to slash bushes around our homes and to keep the compound grass short. Always wash fruits and vegetables thoroughly with clean water before eating. Avoid eating cold food and drinking fluids packed in used plastic bottles. She says vaccines have been availed to handle any emerging infections as a result of floods. Recent research findings indicate a decline of diarrhea infections across the country due to provided vaccines. Kaduchi says even though government has worked tirelessly to boost health services in the country, there are 12 districts that are still affected by these infectious diseases. We therefore call upon the local leaders in these districts to prepare the population so that we can give the second dose of the oral cholera vaccines for these persons in those respective districts. Or we are requesting the public to call our toll-free line, which is 0800-100-066. She requests local government leaders to sensitize and create awareness about hand washing, keeping homes clean, and avoiding self-medication. And adhere to our policy of test, treat, and track policy guidelines. We're calling upon our communities to collect water for household use from National Water and Sewage Cooperation taps and to avoid water from wells or springs because they may be contaminated with diseases that can cause problems. Assistant Commissioner in Charge of Health Services at the Ministry, Dr. Godfrey Buire said there is an exercise to vaccinate residents of 12 districts against cholera. We encourage all you to pass this message over to those communities living in districts. Remaining, like, these districts are remaining along the, the water bodies and along the country border. When we focus on those districts, we remove the organisms which would be available for the other districts. That is why like this vaccination which we are going to do, which government has already done, after we are reaching the end of this vaccination, we have imported additional 1 million doses. I'm Ivan Joko, reporting for UBC here in Kampala. A police report indicating rise in cases of sexual violence, mainly against children, continues to raise dust among child rights activists and policy makers. Ethics and Integrity State Minister Father Simon Lokodo says it is regrettable that such situations exist because it is bad for the country's image. 
The 2020 Police Annual Crime Report indicates that out of the 14,134 defilement victims, 301 children were defiled by people living with HIV. Of these, 120 were defiled by their guardians, while 55 were defiled by their teachers. This, unfortunately, remains just a fraction of the many unreported cases of violence against children, a vice that continues to eat into the moral fiber of the country. We shouldn't forget that it's part of the wider violence against children, but it's only that it's a little bit subtle. Not so many of us talk about it. Even when it happens, you see lots of things around it happening. The parents coming together with the perpetrators to negotiate. It's shameful to discuss. And by the way, for your information, what the police reports to us is just an iceberg. Minister for Ethics and Integrity, Reverend Father Simon Lokodo, describes the findings as alarming yet not surprising considering a track record already on their shelves. These things were going on. We know of cases of incest. We know of cases of children of the same family having, having brought about this situation. And even going to the extent of publicly wedding. You get that? This was a lot before COVID-19. That means there's a total perversion. We have lost the orientation and we're moving haphazardly. While Hassan Molusi of Raising Voices attributes the increasing number of sexual violence against children to the dying collective community responsibility, the fact that about 120 children were sexually harassed by their parents and relatives is yet another puzzle whose answers remain scarce, if not non-existent. We thought that a parent would be the best protector for their children. We thought that the peers, the siblings, would be the best protectors for their own selves. But now we are in a dilemma where parents have become unthinkable. We have become irresponsive. But it's also probably because we do not understand what violence is and we do not value the relationships we have. Although government has come up with a number of laws for the protection of the young ones, the dreadful vice, like sexual violence against children, remains unabated. Even the law enforcers, unfortunately, have been compromised. You take a case of defilement to the police, the way they twist you left and right, ask you for this and that, some money for the files, some money for doing this or going to protect the victim, completely discouraging the whole process of justice. And this is very common, especially in the outskirts there. To remedy this status quo, both government and civil society advocate for renewed collective responsibility on top of empowering toddlers to learn to speak up, as well as tightening the loose ends on the protective measures against any form of violence. So it's a big challenge. We know it's not easy to get it because these things are done behind walls. Dokas Kimono, UBC News. The Uganda Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons members are concerned about the rising cases of cancer. The experts believe that lack of awareness and the delay in treatment is what causes the rise in the numbers. Cancer is one of the most common and feared gastrointestinal diseases, according to the gastrointestinal and endoscopic surgeons at Imulago National Specialized Hospital. Out of Uganda's population of 45 million, they diagnose and treat at least 40,000 new cancer cases each year and record at least 20,000 cancer-related deaths every year. Surgeons have joined hands to ensure treatment of gastrointestinal and avail endoscopic surgery to reduce instances of cancer in the country. Gastrointestinal system is also known as the digestive system or the alimentary canal consisting of the food pipe, which is also known as the esophagus, the stomach, small and large intestines together with accessory organs like the liver, the pancreas and the gallbladder. 
due to failure to turn up for early diagnosis and attending to cancer prevention programs, many patients are diagnosed late and have poor treatment outcomes. They want all Ugandans to seek proper medical attention in a timely manner. Uh, I want to re-emphasize the issue of seeking proper medical care in a timely manner. I know there are many groups of people out there. There are people who are selling uh, herbs, which are supposed to treat everything. There are people who are selling food supplements, which are supposed to treat everything. But at the end of the day, it's your life. Despite efforts by the president to train more doctors in highly specialized fields of medicine, there are still challenges of awareness and equipment. For a big hospital which sees a huge load, probably would probably need more, more advanced equipment to be able to do more. There are more advanced procedures which will require more investment, so that would be something that the government can also look into. It is for this reason that the searches in partnership with Mulago National Specialized Hospital and other partners have organized an endoscopy camp Monday next week. Find anything has changed in the way you go to the toilet. You never used to have constipation, now you have constipation. You never used to have diarrhea, now you have diarrhea. You are passing mucus in stool, you are passing blood in stool. You are having pain in the, in the stomach, which never used to be there, you are having heartburn. It's your life. Go and seek proper medical care. Jane Ramchia, reporting for UBC News. Refugees in Rhino Camp and host communities in Terego District have started farming to increase on the food production and complement efforts by the World Food Organization. They are doing this through a project dubbed Improving Livelihoods for Food Security and was being implemented by the ACAV, one of the humanitarian organizations in the camp. Farmers in the rhino camp and host communities in Terego are now able to sell part of the harvest from their farms to get income and domestic consumption. They revealed this during the closure of the project Improving Livelihoods for Food Security held at Yoro Base Camp. Tabo Susan and Duku Maiko, refugees from Ofua Zone, are some of the beneficiaries of the project. It made me, my family, not to go hungry because I might be able to, my wife could go to the garden and harvest at the end of the day. If the food is almost ending, we, we supplement. I divide them. I take another one for selling, another one I use for my food at the home. And again also, the part of it I will pay with the school fees. And at the inception of the project in 2019, refugees had no land to practice their agriculture for growing cassava and beans. This prompted them to make agreement with landlords to rent land for a period of time so that they plant their crops. Doku Maiko has since become supplier of cassava cuttings of narrow cast and nase, 19 varieties, to the host communities. Very year, I also manage, after harvesting, I also manage to extend at least to an acre, meaning four quarters. So from there, the community benefits from me now by giving them the, the cuttings. According to one of the host community members, Drapari Primo, unreliable rainfall pattern coupled with sandy soil nature posed challenge affecting farming in the refugee camp. The of this place here, you know, when it rains, it rains, wet, it gives a gap for Maybe two weeks without raining. This is sandy, sandy region here. The rate of rain, I mean, most are raised up, evaporates is too high. So it leads to plant, plant, plants to dry with that easily. Refugee Welfare Council chairperson for Rhino Camp Settlement, Martin Wafula, attributes the success for refugees to practicing agriculture for self-reliance. I think it has served very much because we had ration cut where the food was reduced from 12 kilograms per person per month to 7.5 kilograms per month per person. That's why we are appealing that livelihood 
be the sustainable. Head of programs at ACAV, Patrick Bongo Namisi, hailed the project implementation. In achieved. One, we successfully established a demo garden for improved cassava varieties, Marocas 1 and Nasi 19, and then also Narrow Bean 1 and 2, which were established. Meanwhile, Eres Kutesa, who represented Naro during the meeting, noted that their involvement in the project as scientists helped them to be on ground. Equally to your technical team, Abizadi, for providing the technical guidance to us. The two year project dubbed Improving Livelihoods and Food Security that targeted to benefit 450 refugees and host communities surpassed the number. The number of children born with HIV has increased by 18% through mother to child HIV transmission and many of them reportedly died during the COVID-19 lockdown. Coalition for Health Promotion and Social Development Uganda attribute the increased infections to pregnant mothers' failure to diagnose and undertake treatment as prescribed by doctors. Many children continue to die in Uganda because of lack of ready access to effective HIV diagnosis and treatment services. Despite progress at the global level, mother-to-child HIV transmission has become the second leading cause of HIV among infants. The transmission rate is estimated at 3.8% at six weeks and 7.9% at the end of breastfeeding. This has affected Uganda's efforts to achieve the 95-95-95 target for HIV transmission by 2022. Last couple of years we've stagnated our progress towards the elimination of mother-to-child transmission has stagnated. We still have about 1,000 children are dying due to uh, HIV uh, and, and this is caused by one uh, not diagnosing children to 100 percent born to mothers uh, uh, living with HIV. The program's manager, Coalition for Health Promotion and Social Development Uganda, Kenneth Mwehonge, attribute the increase to mother's failure to undergo diagnosis and adhering to treatment guidelines. The highest um, seroconversions rate through breastfeeding, uh, and that means that we are not having uh, mothers adhere to treatment uh, and, 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 and hence transmitting that uh, virus to their children and also not having children uh, be on prophylaxis. And also the social support services, uh, the lack of strong family-centered um, family care services uh, like food, uh, like treatment literacy, knowing how to uh, uh, treat the children, when to adhere to medicine, uh, uh, reporting of uh, adverse events. So the lack of that um, uh, social support. Now these are advocating for an improved funding from government and are advocating for a fourth 95 focusing on quality of people living with HIV and are on ARVs. If you see children living with HIV, they have to struggle with swallowing drugs made for adults. It's not good. Some of the medicines are not good. So that's why we're negotiating for optimized um, regimens, which are user-friendly for these children, so they don't have to suffer twice. They have the disease and they suffer. So we are they have also called on Minister of Health to urgently provide HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis and retesting services for pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. Shaida in Nasaku, UBC News. Corporation. Dr. Engineer Silver Mujisha has called upon the public, especially farmers, to utilize waste extracted from Bogolobi wastewater treatment plant. This was disclosed by Engineer Silver himself on his inspection of Bogolobi Natural Waste Treatment Plant, which is nearing completion. The Nachivuba Bugolobi wastewater treatment plant will handle over 45 million liters of wastewater daily, hence tackling challenges of water shortage in the country. The managing director, National Water and Sewage Corporation, engineer Silva Mgisha, says the plant has the latest water treatment with the latest inbreed technology. There is a lot of scope for many people to be connected to the system for Kampara and be able to treat it. The only work that now remains for national water 
is to continue to reach as many people as possible so that we can collect as much sewage as possible to the, to the treatment works. We have just a slight issue on phosphorus, but that's not an issue compared to the effect it is having on the environment. Engineer Silva Mgisha asserted that the plant will also generate electricity and the solid wastes removed from the wastewater are expected to be dried and sold as fertilizer. Yeah, there is a lot of byproducts here. Apart from providing them with services to collect sewage from their home, we are also, as a product, we are producing manure here, which the public can, can collect. We are also producing manure at uh, Ruvigi, remember. We are, we are going to be producing biogas, but by and large for our own internal, internal use. So the manure is the most important uh, product here. And uh, we are also happy to report to the public that the sewage we discharge to the receiving water bodies is of much better quality than what it used to be. Because now this plant complies on almost all parameters, uh, the total suspended solids, the bio, the, 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 the bio oxygen demand, biological oxygen demand, we are complying. We have just a slight issue on phosphorus. The project involves the construction of an ultra-modern sewage treatment plant in Bogorovi, a sewage pre-treatment plant in Chinawataka, a sewage pumping station on Chibira Road, plus a sewer network, Sudat Kaye, UBC. As Mbara University of Science and Technology prepares for their 27th graduation ceremony, government has been asked to cater for increasing financial support in an education service program. The Vice Chancellor Mbara University of Science and Technology, Professor Oboa Celestino, addressing a press conference at Kihumuru University campus in Mbarara, said all this. Mbarara University of Science and Technology is slated to hold its 27th graduation ceremony. This follows an event during which medicine-related professionals took their Hippocratic oath. That you will not advertise yourself, nor permit yourself to be directly or indirectly advertised. The 300 graduates took the oath included a Bachelor of Medical Laboratory Science, Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, Bachelor of Nursing Science, Bachelor of Pharmacy and Bachelor of Science in Physiotherapy. I'm already uh, been posted in Mbari Regional Referral Hospital as uh, a junior house officer. We have been now for three months. We are doing our level best. I personally started my rotation in obstetrics and gynecology, where we are trying our level best to reduce the maternal mortality and mobility, even the child, uh, a child the infant mortality and, and mobility. And uh, yeah, of course, as doctors, even with the current situation, we are involved in curbing uh, down this situation. And we at our have done much. Uh, that's why even now people now are getting the vaccine and the, and the rest. The Vice Chancellor Mbarara University, Professor Celestino Boa, clarified that in the past people used to study under tree shades and practice writing in the sand, which now is impossible because of innovations in technology. Of course, I recognize the fact that not all parents are able to, to access uh, technology to get this list. But I'm sure there is somebody you can contact to say, my child is not included, my child did not come for graduation. But we want to implore our parents that we need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, COVID is real. We do not know yet know how and when it will disappear uh, from our midst. And so we should protect each other. We should protect them, the students. We should protect the parents as well. Mbarara University of Science and Technology must graduation ceremony will be presided over by its chancellor, Professor Mark Ranga Oren. He revealed that a total of 1,269 graduates shall be awarded degrees and diplomas in various disciplines, of whom 475 are females and 794 are males. Professor Obua clarified that due to the current threatening situation of COVID-19, only 200 selected individuals, including graduates of special performance, shall participate in virtual graduation ceremony. 75 motorcycles are reported to have been stolen.
and only five recovered in the first quarter of this year in Gulu City. This has been attributed to the high demand in the, to their high demand in the districts of Lira and Arua. Another Bajaj 100 BM has been stolen, which has caused mayhem in the Gulu City. Unfortunately, some owners are murdered in the processes of stealing the bikes. Theft of motorcycles in Gulu City has escalated following their high demand in the districts of Varua and Lira. Regan Achaya fell victim of this vice. Following thieves breaking into his store, opened padlocks and accessed the Bajaj 100 motorcycle registration number UEP 321K, among many. Including motorcycles were parked there, but I don't know the intention they really came with, because they just managed to go away with that one bike that belongs to me. I went ahead and reported the case to the police. Dennis Okello Layong, another victim, was shocked when the wall where he kept his brand new Bajaj motorcycle was demolished during a rainy night and his bike stolen. They, I think they came specifically for the Bajaj, the new Bajaj. So they came to, after breaking the wall, they entered in into the, the, into the church and then uh, during that heavy rain, they used that chance to actually cut the lock on the, on the door, which is at the entrance side. The Gulu City Border Border Association reports that 75 motorcycles have been reported to have been stolen from their members. Uh, concerning this stealing, some of them, they are being beaten. They get accident. Then after getting accident, they are being eaten in their head. Uh, those people are being eaten on their head who died. Uh, we had about six members. The speaker of Gulu City Boda Boda Association, Amy Ochen, says that the Gulu main market parking yard is the hot spot. He advises owners of motorcycles to buy extra locks. However, Geoffrey Opio, who has rode on the streets of Gulu for over four years, says they have lost confidence in the association to trace stolen motorcycles. He advocates for manufacturers to put tracking devices. But the biggest challenge is here like this. That for them, they, collect, they are collecting our money every day. They call it over market deal. When you bought a new bike, they will register you at 25000 per bike if you bought. But if, you go, if your bike got lost, when you go there, there's no any serious following up about your bike. There are around 21,000 registered border border riders who majorly use the Bajaj 100 BM in Gulu City with an additional unknown number of private owners. The Gulu resident city commissioner, Stephen Nsoboga, says his office is investigating this current form of insecurity. I understand this, some of these thieves, some come from Lida, some come from Malua. The mosaic was stolen from here, uh, go to where? We find them, they, they take them to Lida, and those students from Lida bring them here. So it is a very big racket which we are studying carefully so that we are able to penetrate them. Very sad story there from the theft of motorcycles in Gulu. We thank you so much for watching. Let's take a very short break. Uh, on return, we have more that you do not have to miss. should stop you from finishing what's yours. That's why MTN gives you data bundles that don't expire. Load MTN Freedom bundles using my MTN app and enjoy the freedom to finish your data bundles. MTN. Today tastes like a new tradition. Like an old favorite. Tastes like all hands on deck and all eyes on the prize. Today tastes like a piece of the action. And it never tasted this good.
Experience a 100% Fuji speeds across Uganda with the Airtel Fuji Pocket Wi-Fi available at 123,000 shillings. Only it comes with a backup battery and 15 GB free for one month. Visit the nearest Airtel shop, device selling shop or Airtel online shop. www.airtel.co.ug slash broadband dash discover. Airtel, the smartphone network. Stopping HIV. What about you? Introducing Cleveland Hill Day and Boarding Primary School, located in Chewando, Chisalu Salu, along Bukoto Roundabout, two kilometers from Kaleri at the Northern Bypass, on your way to Chisasi. This is a world-class standard school with the most qualified teachers that will turn your child into a world changer. We have a fully stocked library, a balanced diet for the children, a calm environment suitable for learning, and pocket-friendly school fees. Registration for P1 to P6 is ongoing and second term is starting on 6th April 2021. Call us on 0774-950-277 or 0705-861-262 for more information. Cleveland Hill Day and Boarding Primary School. The Lord is my shepherd. Has anyone seen Bob? Hmm? Over here! How did you get in there? With my Airtel Money MasterCard. But you don't even have a bank account. Well, it's not a card. It's virtual, so no plastic. And it's safer. But what are you doing there? I want to buy Nancy birthday gift, book my flight tickets, renew my Big Click subscription, and order a shipment. The Airtel Money MasterCard. It's not a card, but works just like one. Get one on the Airtel Money menu on your phone. Thank you so much for watching and welcome back from the break. It's now business news. Civil society organizations want government to direct all efforts towards economic recovery in the face of COVID-19. During uh, their meeting in Kampala, members of the civil society organizations want the budget for security and governance adjusted. Civil society organizations want this year's budget to be trimmed in favor of economic growth than security. It doesn't make sense to start thinking of security when we cannot see, when we cannot even smell that security at this point. So we believe that let money go into areas that are very important to facilitate recovery, to ensure that our people live a much uh, better life. Stakeholders also seek government action to ensure feasible interest rates. According to the Water General's report for 2019-2020 uh, financial year, we had loans of up to 1.3 trillion that were performing very poorly. And some of these, some of these loans even reached their expiry dates before, they were, uh, before full disbursement was made. Meaning we are paying back, we are paying for money that, that we're not even using. Civil society players also seek for ailing of extension workers to help boost agricultural production in the country. The financial government is targeting 22% of households to get extension services from uh, extension workers. However, we're not seeing a plan for uh, recruiting these uh, uh, workers to uh, adequately uh, provide these services. They also propose a product-based approach for ease assessment of the stakeholders' capacity in the regional market. We should readjust re and look at how do we start negotiating 
product-based agreements like Kenya has done, Uganda should follow suit to ensure that we have uh, mobilized products which we can sell on these uh, renegotiated markets. Again, we also propose that uh, there is a need to support UNBS with resources and specifically. Despite regional embracement of digital platforms, economists perceive Uganda is taking different direction based on the way taxes are being increased on the enablers. And we should be able to subsidize the cost of data to ensure that we bring the majority of the people who are embracing uh, digitalization be able to explore opportunities that Abdul Nasil Lubwama, UBS News. Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, in partnership with oil companies and the joint venture partners, have concluded a pilot project that is meant to help smallholder farmers in the Albertine region. The Agriculture Development Project was implemented in the districts of Hoima, Chikube, Bolisa, and Nwoya. Smallholder farmers in the Albertine Graben are benefiting from a pilot project of sustained increase in food and nutrition security between Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industries and Fisheries and oil companies. Abdu Mogisha, a senior agribusiness officer in Maif, said that this project will empower the smallholder and medium enterprise farmers to tap from the oil and gas industry. There are about five or so quick win projects. One was to support farmers, horticultural farmers, to produce and supply the oil and gas sector market with horticultural products. The target was 500 farmers, but we supported 214 farmers that we have been working on to produce horticultural products and supply various markets. Brenda Bitagasi, a piggery farmer from Bujumbura Cell in Hoima City, says that before the start of the ADP project, they were rearing local breeds of pigs, but the returns were very low, while other beneficiaries of the project give their experience. <laughs> So they have a one, co one cooperative. Plan, yopumbika, halibara sara ga ente ne mpulu kuruji. The senior presidential advisor on oil and gas and the mineral industry, Dr. Fred Kavagambe Kalisa, says local farmers have to conform to the standards if they are to supply oil companies. Rosette Komgisha, the national content lead at Toto. ENP says that oil companies are ready to take up local products so long as they conform to the standards. The ADP project that was implemented by South Hope Africa on behalf of the joint venture partners Toto and CNOOC has supported 500 smallholder farmers to produce and supply diverse food items to different markets. Through funds from this project, Hoima District local government has been able to complete the construction and operationalization of the pig abattoir, supported 225 pig farmers to adapt improved management practices. Over 300,000 refugee youth in Kampala are to benefit from an application jailed at creation of job opportunities. The initiative is being piloted by Massey Copes and the African Executive Leaders Solutions, a, a, a thought leadership solutions organization. The two entities are currently working closely with the Directorate of uh, Industrial Training to bridge the skills gaps in the refugee population. I choose to work a web and mobile app connects skilled workers from the informal sector with job opportunities. A variety of skilled services such as plumbing, electrical wiring, building, tutoring, welding, hairdressing, computer programming, marketing, farm management are available on the digital platform. It would be like saying this is an Uber platform for jobs. So if you want uh, a service provider, 
you will download the app which is um, available on Android or you can go to the website and you'll follow the instruction it will show you what you want uh, if you are a service provider and you want to enroll it will ask you for specific information and by the way it is this information that uh, we will build into our database that is able to determine whether you are actually a refugee or not. Uganda is the second largest refugee hosting country in the world with the refugee population making at least 3.6 percent of the estimated 45 million people in the country However, according to the 2021 United Nations High Commission for Refugees report, 64% of the refugees in Uganda are unemployed, despite a significant number being imparted with life skills. As far as I'm aware, the, the numbers of refugees that have already been assessed uh, exceeds 4,000. And there are many, many organizations which are, they are, they are planning to support still refugees. That if you have a skill, just make it a decision to work and earn from that skill. Don't wait for an eight to five job. So that's what inspired us to create the platform. And we then engaged the Maseko to see if we can pilot the platform within Kampala. The digital solution has been designed to cater for georeferencing where only taskers within a radius of 20 kilometers from the customer posting the task or job gets a job or task alert. This is intended to increase turnaround time for service delivery and also reduce the operational costs so as to have competitive pricing for the task. Dennis Igor for UBC News. Stakeholders in the agricultural sector have been urged to embrace information technology and communication innovations for efficient and profitable trade. This was emphasized at the ATIS Agritech Agri Symposium in Kampala. Uganda's economy is largely agriculture based, and the sector employs about two thirds of the country's adult population. However, with an increasing number of educated youth, ICT is becoming a promising area to foster the agricultural development potential in the domestic and export markets for information, technology-enabled services. As an SME or within whatever sector you play in, we need to begin to start looking and saying, what is it that is going to help me reach the, that client that I desire who is seated in Arizona, for example? And I think it is technology. How do we begin to start identifying markets? With the high certification taxes of products and the implementation of several COVID-19 standard operating procedures, such as transport restrictions, agribusiness has experienced challenges in accessing both inputs and markets. We have to certify every product differently and every product calls for a different amount of money for certification. So you find that it's very hard for us to do certification and to be in the market. And Thus, the sector can no longer afford to ignore the need to innovate and rely on ICT solutions. That is when we saw the typical marriage of IT and trade. Most of us had to find the quickest way have internet at home beyond the phone. We have to make sure that we are connected and, 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 and the whole trade of agriculture and, uh, and services and IT became one. So when you are going to buy sugar, you also have to buy, to also buy data bundles. Stakeholders in the agriculture sector have been called upon to invest in tools that can increase access to and management of information increase value addition and integrate relationships across the entire value chain. So that's why I feel IT is very, very important for agriculture development. Because when it comes to value addition, you're there. Processing, packaging, branding, so other solutions, all this is IT. The Agritech Symposium, hosted by Alliance for Trade in Information, Technology and Services, sought to expand on how IT solutions can be adopted to increase efficiency in trade while reducing the cost of doing business, creating employment, 
and ultimately increase income. Charlotte Amoge, and Robin Yoso, for UBC News. Twenty twenty was the year the tourism sector got disconnected. But this year we reconnect to leads, growth, to industry experts, to wider markets, to untapped potential. Be part of the first ever virtual Pearl of Africa Tourism Expo and engage with industry experts from around the world. Find out how you can grow your leads, put your tourism business back on the map, and a whole lot more. Sign up for free at www.poate.co.ug slash register and reconnect with your world. The Pearl of Africa Tourism Tourism Expo runs from the 27th to the 29th of April 2021 and is proudly brought to you by Uganda Tourism Board. Muhammad Idris Debi Idno, one of the late president's sons, is a 37-year-old four-star general. Opposition politicians in Chad have rejected the army's appointment of President Idris Deby's son to take over the work of his death. Young general, he was in charge of his father's security detail. Now, following Idris Deby's death, his son has been thrust into the spotlight as the head of the country's transitional military council. The body is made up of generals from Deby's inner circle who have vowed to organize free elections in the coming 18 months. The defense and security forces are not seeking to seize power. We assure you that the members of the Transitional Military Council will hand over power to a civilian government. Amid growing instability, the army has imposed a curfew and the country's borders will remain shut. On the streets of the capital, N'Djamena, locals have mixed reactions. From a security point of view, the president played an important role. And now we're already seeing some instability. So we're worried about his sudden death. They're already talking about the dissolution of parliament. We have a constitution, so in my opinion, it's a coup d'etat. The army has said that President Idris Deby died during clashes with rebels in the north of the country as he led troops fighting armed insurgents based in neighboring Libya. On April 11th, the rebels crossed into Chad and were thought to be advancing towards the capital as voters were heading to cast their ballots. News of Deby's death emerged just hours after the leader had been officially declared the winner of the presidential election. And that brings us to the end of news tonight. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Michael Jordan Lukoma with Elizabeth Nakakoni and the whole team. Wish you all the best, especially a good night. But before you go to bed, do not miss our program behind the headlines tonight. Do not miss the 39th edition of the program. And tonight we'll have the Honorable Henry Oriem Okelu, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, uh, Edith Sempala, Uganda's former ambassador to the U.S., Fred Mokasambide is the DP Vice President, Sarah Birete, the Executive Director at the Center for Constitutional Governance, and the discussion will center on the implications of U.S. visa restrictions slapped on Uganda. Thank you so much for watching. Do not go to bed before you watch this program. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Brought to you by At Umeme, your safety is our top priority. Report illegal practices to Umeme when you detect them. Download the Umeme app for other services. Stay alert, stay safe, save lives. Umeme, powering Uganda. Welcome. Here we are again with a weather forecast from the weather center with our Semper Alex Kim. 
It is a continuation of uh, rainfall activities across uh, the country because we are into the rainfall season. By 9 a.m. this morning, various parts of the country reported some rainfall, like Karengere reported 15.8 millimeters, Tororo 13.2, while Bududa reported 15.2 millimeters of rainfall. Now, this is so because at this moment, the rain belt is quite aligned over our region, but we also have uh, moist uh, southeasterlies that are coming in, uh, giving us more wet weather activities. We do expect to see uh, some chances of uh, some thundering rainfall that will be across the central and uh, parts of the Lake Victoria Basin. But uh, for the northern uh, eastern part of the country, we do expect sunny intervals. But well, into the afternoon, we expect uh, a pickup of rainfall activities that will be across most parts of the country. Though we do expect it to be quite thundering, that will also be in the northern of the country. Now, because of this, we do expect temperatures to rise to 31 degrees centigrade to be across Karamoja region. For our nation's capital, we are expecting 27 degrees centigrade, and in Kawale Highlands, we are forecasting at 23 degrees centigrade. Well, across the globe, we are forecasting some chances of rainfall that will be for Nairobi at a daytime high of only 26 degrees centigrade, but for Dubai, bright and sunny conditions at a daytime high of 37 degrees centigrade. With that, we wrap it up. Stay tuned and join us again tomorrow, same time. Brought to you by. At Umeme, your safety is our top priority. Report illegal practices to Umeme when you detect them. Download the Umeme app for other services. Stay alert, stay safe, save lives. Umeme, powering Uganda. Burnley's visit to Old Trafford is our first stop on the weekend when Manchester United revealed themselves as one of six English proponents of a new midweek European League, a story that's gone on to dominate the football headlines. On their own turf, United haven't beaten the Clarets for six years. They were, though, seeking a fifth successive league win after overcoming Tottenham last week to tighten their grip on second place. Mason Greenwood in for Edinson Cavani, United's only change. Sean Dyche made two with Burnley.